Hello, welcome to Toronto Apologetics. My name is Tony Costa, and today in this video, I'm going to be continuing answering questions on Christmas. Today, we're going to be dealing with a very common uh, theme that we usually hear around Christmas, and that is the question of the Magi. How many Magi were there? Of course, if you are familiar with um, nativity sets or if you're familiar uh, with uh, Christmas pageants, which unfortunately uh, much of our secular world has removed uh, and tried to uh, get rid of Jesus and any reference to his birth uh, during this time. Uh, invariably, the question always arises about the Magi. And traditionally, we have usually understood the Magi to be these three uh, wise men, as it's sometimes translated. So we're going to look at two versions Bible versions on Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. The first one is taken from the ESV, the English Standard Version, and the second one is taken from the New American Standard Bible. So the ESV says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The New American Standard Bible says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, magi, from the Greek word magoi, from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now notice the ESV, the English Standard Version, and even the uh, old uh, authorized version, the King James Version, will translate the word Magoi as wise men. There's nothing wrong with that translation because the Magoi were considered to be an academic guild in Persia, uh, although they were also uh, astrologers. Um, and by astrology, we need to be careful that in the ancient world, there was an occultic dimension to astrology, but astrology for others was the same name given to the study of the heavenly bodies, what we today call astronomy. But we, we just need to be careful that, that some, some academics in the first century who studied the heavenly bodies were uh, called astrologers. Some of them were just interested in the science of the heavenly bodies, but some of them were truly involved in, in occultism. But notice in the New American Standard Bible, they, they literally transliterate the word there, um, into English as magi. And in the square brackets, I place there the Greek word that Matthew uses. He uses the word magoi, which is the plural word. So the word magi is plural. That's why in the ESV it's translated wise men. Um, notice they take one word and they break it into two words, wise men. So it is plural. And of course, the question is, well, how many were there? Well, the reason why traditionally uh, people have held to the view that the Magi were three men uh, was because of the gifts that was given to the Christ child, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But this is unnecessary. Uh, we don't have to conclude that because there were three gifts, there was three men. There could have, in fact, been 10 Magi. There could have been 15 Magi. There could have been four Magi. There could have been three, but it didn't have to be uh, reduced to just three. So because the word magoi is plural, uh, it definitely means more than two, but um, it doesn't mean that it has to be only three. There could have been, um, as I said, a, a, a number of them. And each group, let's say there were 15, five of them would have given gold, a group of five would have given them, given the Christ child uh, frankincense, and the other five would give them myrrh. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we only had three men. The other issue, of course, is that when we see depictions of the Magi, you will notice that they tend to wear crowns. And the idea behind this is that in later Christian tradition, the Magi were also taken to be kings. Now, there's nothing in Matthew's gospel to suggest that the Magi were kings. We know the word Magi. It's where we get the word magic from, by the way. And so the Magoi uh, were also those who were sorcerers, those who were involved, as I said, in the magical arts and so forth. And it is from that word, we get the English word magic. But in the course of Christian history, the idea arose that the Magi were also kings. And they also tried to show the Magi 
uh, as as coming from different, they, they came from Persia. We know that the Magi were from Persia, but you notice in Christian art, they, they tend to try to uh, represent the various uh, skin colors of the world. And so in some depictions, you will have Magi who are white, brown, black, and so forth and so on. But we're not told anything other than the fact that they were uh, Magi from Persia. They were Persians. And they could have possibly also been Zoroastrians, which was an ancient uh, Persian religion. So this idea of the Magi being kings has, unfortunately, has been perpetuated in, in Christmas songs like We Three Kings, um, which was written by John Hopkins in 1857. And unfortunately, uh, songs like this continue to foster this idea that the Magi were also kings. And so if you look at the lyrics of the song, We Three Kings of Orient Are, Bearing gifts, we traverse afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star, O star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty, bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. And so uh, today, when, when Christians sing songs like We Three Kings, remember in a previous video, I said, unfortunately, a lot of our hymns and some of our Christmas carols are just really um, uh, misrepresentative of of what actually was the case. And so uh, there is there is historical inaccuracies in a number of our Christmas carols, and, and this is one of them. So where did the idea come that the Magi were, were kings? Where did this idea come from? And incidentally, they were later given names uh, like uh, Melchior and, and Belshazzar and, Ka and uh, Gaspar and so forth. Um, so there's always that temptation. When people are named in the Bible, they'll end up getting names for them. Well, where did this idea come from? Well, uh, Christians began to look at Messianic passages in the Old Testament, and they looked at this passage, for example, may the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. Uh, this is a Messianic psalm. It's referring to the Messianic king. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. And so some Christians, when they read Psalm 72, and they came to verses 10 to 11, they took the words... Uh, the, the kings of Sheba and Seba, uh, bringing gifts to this king, they took that to mean that this was a reference to the Magi and that the Magi were kings and that they brought gifts uh, to the Messianic king. Uh, and so if you look at Psalm 72, it's clearly a Messianic uh, psalm referring to the king, the coming king. And so you could see how someone who had read Matthew, the birth story of Jesus and Matthew, and they came across this, they would, they would assume that these magi were, in fact, a fulfillment of this prophecy. And therefore, since it mentions kings here, well, then the magi must be kings. And that, of course, is uh, a misrepresentation. Uh, again, the magi came uh, from Persia, uh, and they were not kings. They were wise men, or uh, what we would call uh, astrologers. Now, when we look at our nativity sets today, of course, uh, what you tend to see, unfortunately, is, uh, and I apologize, the, the, the image is a little fuzzy, but uh, what you'll notice is that in Christmas scenes today or nativity scenes, you'll always notice everything is collapsed together. So you look at Matthew and Luke and you'll notice how these nativity sets uh, try to collapse everything together. So you'll notice the, uh, the Magi there, you'll notice on the left, you have one uh, bowing. Notice the one behind him. Notice again the skin color, um, a, a darker skin color. You'll notice on the other end there, uh, you'll notice uh, another of the Magi there as well. And notice on the left side how the Magi are bearing crowns. Again, the idea that they were kings. And you'll also notice a shepherd there with the uh, lamb on his shoulder. So that story comes from Luke too. Magi come from Matthew too. And then the angel, of course, with the word Gloria, glory to God in the highest, that's also in Luke too. So you need to be careful because the assumption here is that the Magi met with the shepherd, they all came together and, and everything just converges together. But this is not necessarily uh, what happened. Uh, there's really nothing to indicate that the Magi actually went to the place where Jesus was born. And so if you continue to read in the gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 2, 9 to 11. This was after Herod had said that he was going to um, kill all the, the little children in Bethlehem two years and under. And notice in Matthew 2, verses 9 to 11, 
It says, and behold the star that they had seen when it rose before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, notice the house there. It doesn't mention a cave. It doesn't mention a stall. It says going into the house, which is the Greek word okien, from the, the word oikos in Greek, which means house. Going into the house, the okien, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So notice the three gifts there. This is why people assume that the Magi were, were three, uh, three people, three men. Again, that's not necessarily the case, but I want you to notice again, the Magi went into the house, which would indicate that Mary and Joseph had taken the child uh, already away from the, the, um, the district of Herod's uh, authority. They took the child away. And it's very possible that the Magi didn't catch up to them. Perhaps we're not given the time frame, but it's possible they may have caught up with them probably a couple of months later, probably a month later or so. Um, remember, the order was to kill children two years and under. Uh, it's also very possible that when the Magi came um, to Herod's palace in Jerusalem, it's very possible that two years may have elapsed already. Uh, we're not sure. Um, because why would Herod ask to kill children two years and under, unless the Magi were in search of the child who could have been already two years of age by this time? And therefore, it's not surprising that they enter into a house, not into a stable, not into a cave, but into the oikos, into the oikian, the house. I want you to notice just for theological purposes that notice it mentions the child with Mary, his mother. It it's very careful, Matthew's careful to say that this child is Mary's son, Mary's child. He's not Joseph's child. He's not the son of Joseph. It's the child with Mary, his mother. And when they saw, notice this, when they saw the child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and worshiped. Who did they worship? They worshiped him. They didn't worship them. This isn't the Magi worshiping the Madonna and child, as we see in Roman Catholic art or uh, the adoration or the veneration of the Madonna and so forth. Notice where they directed their worship. They did not direct their worship to Mary and Jesus. They directed their worship to him, to the king, the newborn king. And they offered gifts to him. Very important. Worship is never to be directed at anyone but God. And because the Lord Jesus Christ was God incarnate, God in the flesh, he was rightfully the recipient of their worship. Another passage that may have influenced these early Christians about the Magi is Isaiah 60, verse 67. A multitude of camels in this passage, incidentally, is talking about the future glory of Israel. In Isaiah 6, uh, verse 1, uh, it says um, that they are to arise and shine for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And it talks about light shining out. It talks about the nations coming to the light of God's Messiah. And here it points out a multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news. What is good news? The gospel, the praises of the Lord. And so if anything, if there's any passage that probably uh, would be a likely candidate for the fulfillment of the Magi, it is this passage that these young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba, they will come and notice what they offer. They bring gold and frankincense, two of the gifts that are two out of the three gifts that are mentioned. And notice the reference to the good news, the gospel, and the reference to the praises of the Lord. And so I trust that this uh, video has been helpful. I trust that it's uh, given you some food for thought. And uh, once again, uh, it's very important that we go back to the sources, go back to the evidence, and let's not be, uh, let's just be very careful not to let traditions um, trip us up and cause us to stumble. Let's stick to the text of scripture. 
Let us understand where tradition came and where embellishments arose, but always remember not everything that uh, appears appears as it may seem. And so thanks again for watching and uh, look forward to uh, having you in another uh, video broadcast. Please make sure to subscribe to the video and to like the video. Make sure to pass it along as well. So thank you and we'll talk to you soon. Uh, incidentally, I'm putting in the description box as well that uh, starting on January the 23rd, 2021, I am teaching a new course, an online course open to anyone. And it will be on the subject of logic. It's a course on logic. And so if you're interested, please look in the description box. You will have information there on uh, registration and uh, the, the time uh, when this course will run. And so hope to see you as well uh, in that course in the new year. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. God bless and Merry Christmas.